Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF, and I'm so pleased to be joined by three members of our esteemed artistic directorial team for this very special pre-concert talk prior to our performance by the Boston Early Music Festival Vocal and Chamber Ensembles entitled Tempro La Cetra. Joining me on the internet stage are BEMF artistic co-directors Paul Odette and Stephen Stubbs and BEMF orchestra director Robert Neely. Welcome Paul, Steve and Robert. Thank you. Before we begin, as a reminder to those in attendance, this evening's concert video premiere beginning at 8 p.m. can be viewed at any time between now and Sunday, July 11th. In fact, for an entire month, as is the case with all of our BEMF 2021 virtual performances. If you have not yet purchased a ticket to this performance, you may do so at any time by visiting our website, bemf.org. And remember a wonderful consequence of producing this all virtual festival is that we don't have to worry about running out of tickets or selling out the very best seats in the house. We have an infinite number of tickets available and I can assure you that every seat is fantastic. Steve, I'd like to start with you. Rehearsing and recording this concert very recently in Boston was an historic and important occasion as it represented the first time in nearly 16 months that a selection of BEMF artists, indeed members of the BEMF vocal and chamber ensembles, gathered together to make music in person. As our viewing audience will soon see, we went to great lengths and responsible lengths uh, to assure the safety of our entire company, from wearing masks during rehearsals and recording sessions, to maintaining required distances from one another in the rehearsal and recording studio providing proof of negative COVID test results and more. Adhering to the challenges of COVID times for you required designing a program using just one or two singers at a time instead of multiple singers. Why did a program of vocal solos and duets lead you to the, explore the repertoire of, of Monteverdi's 1619 book seven? That's a, a very precise question and uh, when we first started thinking about a Monteverdi program for the festival, we started thinking about book eight, which is his final, his final sort of will and testament of his madrigal work, uh, which includes also solos and duos, but in, includes a lot of big works for a six part ensemble and so on. Um, but book seven has the particular um, moment in Monteverdi's career when he, he saw the possibility to explore the vocal duet in particular as a vehicle for getting independent from the five and six part madrigal that he had uh, been devoted to before that. Actually, if you look over Monteverdi's entire career and um, Paul and I have been exploring it from top to bottom for a long time. Um, if you look at the beginnings uh, with Orfeo in 1607 and the Vespers of 1610, you already see the incipient um, use of solo and duo as a vehicle for independence from the five-part madrigal. Um, but it seems that around the time of, of the 1619 book, or for the few years before that, uh, he had been sort of driving that particular vehicle as a, as a sort of experimental thing to see how far it would go and, and to what heights it could rise. And so picking the best of the duos and solos from uh, book seven, seemed to be the way to go. We actually also dipped into book eight for the Onyamante e Guerrier, uh, which is uh, so, uh, just a fantastic piece. And it has one moment with, uh, with three singers, although uh, it's mainly for one and two. And the reason that that's uh, of importance is because of the nature of uh, Monteverdi's experiments at the end of his um, compositional career with music for war. He's, he writes that uh, everybody knows how to write music for love, everybody does that, but he's inventing a new way of writing music for war. And his big experiment with that was in 1625 when he wrote the Combattimento, which is basically one long essay in how to portray uh, war and, and, and battle uh, in music. 
and here in the Onyamantie Guerriere, there's a large bass solo that uses the same technique that he developed in the Combattimento, which he called Concitato, where you divide one bar into 16 uh, consistent beats, which makes this sort of visceral effect of you know, blades clashing and so on. So you get a bit of the, the effect of uh, the combattimento all in that one bass solo. So that, that made a kind of exciting program for us to go through the, the, the wonderful duets, but also that particular solo. Mm. Fantastic. Paul, a rather straightforward and honest question for you. With my presenter and producer hat on, the music of Claudio Monteverdi, one of the most important composers of the turn of the 17th century, is still today a huge box office hit. Over 400 years later, what makes Monteverdi's music so special and why does it continually withstand the test of time? Oh boy, the, how many hours do we have to discuss the genius of, of Monteverdi because there are so many aspects uh, to it. Um, I think that one very important part of this is Monteverdi's interest in musically portraying every human emotion and often putting them side by side in sharp contrast to one another. There's a very interesting uh, document uh, published by the librettist to Monteverdi's penultimate opera, the music of which is unfortunately lost, Le Nozze d'Enea. But this librettist writing a, a text for Monteverdi for the first time said, knowing how much Monteverdi revels in sharp emotional contrast from one moment to the next, in the ability to portray sounds of nature in a clear musical way and all of the other fantastic variety of, of colors and ideas that Monteverdi likes to put into his music. I was very conscious in writing texts that gave him lots of opportunities for making these very sharp contrasts. Um, and I think Monteverdi's music is quite simply the most varied of all of the Italian composers of the first half of the 17th century. He wrote in more forms than any other composer of the time. He really explored every genre that was available at the time. He could write a fantastic tune. He was an innovator with bold harmonic experiments that got him into trouble with some of his contemporaries because if he wanted to portray harshness, he used dissonances that were not allowable at the time, but those simply heightened the effect uh, of the music. And if you look at so many of his uh, pieces, whether on a small scale or a large scale, it is this kaleidoscopic quality that he goes from one thing to the next to the next in this uh, duo stroke trio that Steve just described, On Yamantie Guerriere. Um, in, in the beginning, there is a change of meter, of character, of rhythms, of tessitura, of texture, almost every 12 bars or so. And I think that really takes the listener on a, on a very special journey. And you couple that with his amazing melodic gift, his amazing sense of harmony and, and structure, and the music is just irresistible. Beautiful. Robert, although his first position in Mantua was as an instrumentalist, Monteverdi didn't leave us with any instrumental music, except for a few brief sinfonias. On tonight's program, you are performing some sonatas by his close colleague, Dario Castello. Can you introduce us to this mysterious figure and to his modern music? He is a very mysterious figure indeed. Yeah, it's, it's very strange that um, we don't have anything from Monteverdi except for just a couple of Ritornellos and a handful of Sinfonias, which probably is not the whole picture. As, as Paul said, we're, you know, we're missing one great opera from the end of his career, and we're also missing the biggest hit of his early career, the Ariana. We only have the lament from that. So it's quite likely that there could well have been a lot of court music that he wrote that just disappeared along the way. Um, what we do have this, um, a contemporary of Monteverdi and also a collaborator with Monteverdi, it's clear that 
this guy, Dario Castello, um, knew Monteverdi well enough that he actually um, uses the what Steve was talking about, the Stile Concitato in some of his sonatas. And um, it seems clear that he was likely working with Monteverdi at San Marco in Venice. The funny thing about him is that we we, there's, he left no trace in history. We, have, we don't know when he was born. We don't know when he died. Um, this wonderful musicologist, Eleanor Selfridge Field published this great article about in search, of, in search of this figure, his no baptismal records of anyone by that name. They wonder if people thought maybe it's an anagram, maybe it's Monteverdi in disguise. But um, what we do know is that he published these two collections where he says he's part of the head of the wind band at San Marco and he, he calls them sonate concertantes, which that is sonatas with um, solo moments as well as 2D moments. Um, and they're in the stile moderno. So he's really casting this music as part of the same movement that Monteverdi was very consciously part of, that this is new music, this is modern stuff. And a lot of it has the exactly the same contrast that, that Paul was talking about in Monteverdi, that um, you have these really sharp moments of moving abruptly from a carefree dance to a dramatic soliloquy, um, from homophonic um, impassioned outbursts from the whole ensemble to these wonderful effects of even some wonderful echo effects at the very end of one of the sonatas where he, he calls on the tradition of San Marco to create this, this atmosphere. Um, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, compositional language and it's, it's really kind of the only one among the many people who were writing this new form of sonatas in the early 17th century that really is at the level of Monteverdi. So it's, it's a wonderful pairing to put them together. That's fascinating. Steve, you determined the title for this program, Tempro la Cetra, I Tune the Liar, pardon my Italian. Does this have a larger meaning beyond the title of one of Monteverdi's pieces? It, it gets right to the heart of um, what all of the artists of the time were really dedicated to, which was to reviving the, the secrets of ancient Greek art and music. Um, what they knew about the ancient Greek uh, music was very little in terms of what it actually was as music, but what they knew about it was the effect it had on the listeners. It had the effect of moving the listener to tears or laughter or getting up and going off to war. I mean, it's, it's, it's really supposed to um, literally change the lives of the listeners. And looking around, this is, these, these thoughts and conversations were happening in the 1580s and 1590s. Uh, they said, well, but our music is very beautiful, but it doesn't actually do any of those things. And so the, the, um, the idea came to all of the artists at that time, that the, the way to do this, the way to make something that was literally moving uh, to the emotions was to concentrate on the solo singer, was to put the, uh, all of the, the uh, art, the, the poetry, um, the music, even the movement, if it's a stage thing, into the hands of a, of a solo singer who would really be capable of telling a story that would get right to the heart of moving the emotions. So uh, all to say that uh, what they wanted to do was to um, recreate the wonders of ancient Greek music. And the other thing that they knew about ancient Greek music was some of the names of the instruments that were used in that, which were uh, like the lyra and the chetra. And so uh, you, you have modern new instruments being invented like uh, the instrument that pa Paul and I play, the kitarone, which is basically supposed to be a big chetra or the instrument that uh, David Morris is playing on this concert, which is called the lirone, the big lira. So they are, they are literally tr trying to embody this, this ancient Greek idea in new clothes and new music, as Robert said, it's, it's, very, it's very curious that they're looking at the past, but creating something that was consciously new. It's a little bit like what we feel we're doing. Um, but uh, so the, this tempora la cetra, it's sort of clothing all of that. And the other, the other thing is that it uses the whole string orchestra plus the lirone, plus the chitarone, all of those instruments together represent a kind of idealized lyre. And then you have the soloist, in this case, Aaron Sheehan, 
uh, embodying that other principle of being able to move the emotions by the solo, solo voice. So it really wraps up everything all together. It also has a, an, an echo of the, the idea of an operatic prologue. It's very much like the, the role of La Musica back in Orfeo in 1607. So this is literally the prologue to his whole collection. It's like an operatic prologue, but it's just there in the book. And when it comes to life, you feel it. You feel it's, it's like the, the beginning. And so it had to be the beginning of our program. Mm. So interesting. Well, it's interesting that um, in talking about this style of music and the solo singer moving the emotions of the listener, uh, Monteverdi's contemporary Giulio Caccini, who, who really wrote the, the book on how to perform this music, said there are three main considerations or uh, focuses in bringing this music to life. The most important is the story, la favela, the text and expressing the text in a rhetorically vivid way. The second is rhythm. And the third is the color or sound of the voice. And he said, it's very important that you consider them in that order and not the other way around. And one of the issues we confront with modern singers of Baroque music is that they add a fourth element that they put on the top, which is what fancy ornaments can I sing? Caccini said that's not interesting for this music at all. It's not about ornamentation and it's not about the sound. It is about telling this story and declaiming the language in a way that really pulls the listener into the story in, in, in a moving way. Robert, the new music of Monteverdi and his contemporaries is centered around the power of music to convey the full emotional meaning of the text. What happens when there aren't any words, like in the songs <laughs> you're playing tonight? That's a good question. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question, and it's one that um, that a lot of people actually it, it comes up a lot in both the 17th and the 18th century. There's that fantastic moment when the sonata comes to France. And these French philosophers, these philosophers are like, I, I don't, sonade, qui me veux tu? What do you want? What am I supposed to feel about this? Because there's no text, there's no form. It's just a, um, it's a wordless conversation. So in some ways it's a little bit like abstract art. It's like, I don't know what to make of this. Um, there it is, <laughs> it's incredible, but um, because the whole idea of this new form, the idea of the sonata, which was which was born right at this moment. Um, and it, it literally just, it's something that sounded, that's all it is. It has no structure, it has no predefined structure. Um, and they talk about it a lot as being whatever the composer um, in, is inspired to do. So it's, it's, a, it's a realm of freedom. Um, but then within that, it's very much tied up with, uh, with how to declaim rhetorically without words. So often these sonatas are kind of constructed like rhetorical arguments. There's an introduction, there's a, you know, an exordium and then there's a discussion of someone will introduce a little theme, a point, and then everyone will have a long conversation about that particular issue. And then we'll move on to a very different issue. Um, but it's it's really interesting for us as instrumentalists to, to find the power of these gestures um, without words and to make them as vivid and as eloquent as we can, um, even though we're not, we don't know what we're depicting. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you find, Robert, that uh, there's a lot of information to be gleaned from the comparison with, for instance, Monteverdi's duets. It's not just that uh, by writing uh, duets for two equal voices over a bass, that, that uh, Monteverdi developed a system which was very much like two violins over a bass. Uh, so there's that comparison. But also I'm thinking about the particular, the particular distinction between what is called either allegro or just normal and adagio, the, the, the portions that are uh, slower. And uh, if you think of in, in this particular case, you would have the example of um, Zephyro Torna, which is uh, the final duet of our, of our concert. One of the most fantastic uh, and delightful pieces that Monteverdi wrote uh, all over this chacona bass. And the chacona is a, is a, a wonderful thing because it's not just a, a recurring bass, but within it, it has a kind of jazzy, double meaning, it's pum pum, pim pum, yup pum, pum pa. So it's, it's sort of like takes you right into the world of kind of 17th century jazz. Uh, 
-hmm. And the, the tenors over that bass uh, are talking about springtime and, and all the, the birds and the leaves coming out and wonderful things. And then suddenly the chacona stops and they say, but I, I alone am suffering of the loss of love and so on. And it descends into this adagio. And, and so really it's a picture of that dichotomy between the sort of jazzy bumbling along uh, fun of, uh, of allegro music and the, the passionate side of adagio music. Absolutely. Paul, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the role of the continuo instruments in this music, um, especially that one that Steve just referred to, the most unusual Lirone, played by our veteran Benfield Orchestra member, David Morris. Well, they had a large number of different kinds of continuo instruments available to them in the late 16th and early 17th century, which Monteverdi and his contemporaries, one assumes, must have um, deployed uh, according to the affect of, of the moment. So if something was agitato, if it was agitated uh, in this stile concitato we're talking about, you have to have a harpsichord rumbling around to create this sort of turbulence. And indeed, that's the way Monteverdi uses the harpsichord in his very explicit instructions in Orfeo about which continuo instrument should uh, accompany which moments. So in general, the soft, what we call the soft pluckers, which are lutes of various types, uh, chitarrone, uh, baroque guitar, harp, etc., accompany the most intimate, the most heartfelt, um, obviously the softest, uh, most expressive music. The lirone was used specifically for moments of lament. It was the instrument that accompanied uh, laments at the time. It can't play fast notes. All it can do is play three note chords um, in inversions. Um, and so it's very good at being able to beautifully shape dynamically long notes where the harmony is not moving very quickly. If the harmony moves quickly, the lirone just doesn't function um at all and if you combine the soft pluckers and the harpsichord and the lirone with the possibility of doubling the bass line which was not an automatic thing done in the 17th century the students of baroque music who come from the 18th century practice of having the the continuo line the bass line always doubled by a cello or a viola da gamba or a bassoon or a, a trombone immediately tend to apply this practice to the uh, music of the 17th century as well and it's very clear again from Monteverdi's instructions in Orfeo and in the uh, book eight madrigals that the addition of the bowed bass was for the emphasis of special moments. It wasn't an automatic default. There was always something doubling uh, the baseline. And I think that's a very important artistic decision which every performer has to make. When is a bowed bass going to play? When is it not going to play? When are you going to accompany with soft pluckers? When is the harpsichord playing? When is the lirone playing? When do you have everyone playing? And, and that really is an interpretive decision based on the affect of the music at any given moment. Monteverdi's contemporary Emilio de Cavalieri wrote in the preface to his um, opera stroke oratorio, we're not quite sure what it is, the rappresentazione di anima e di corpo. He said the instrumentation should change according to the affect of the moment, not according to the character singing it. And I have to say that coming back to um, our Benf community after so long away, it was it was just extraordinary to to hear this amazing sound of the Benf Continuo team. It's just, it's such a magic, magic, magic thing. And it um, it was, it almost had me in tears the first day just to hear that sound again. It's very special. It's nice to hear. 
I think we were all pretty much in tears when we finally got back together again and we started playing and we were too far apart to be able to hear one another, but it was such an emotional experience that after 16 months, we could make music uh, together again. So I have a question for, for any one of you, feel free to jump in. We talked about this a little bit. Monteverdi often compares love to war in these pieces with the battle often lost. He frequently uses this theme, especially in his later years. Do we know if he was personally disillusioned by love? I don't think we have that kind of biographical information about Monteverdi. We have a lot of his letters, uh, right? Which is the, the main sort of personal information that we get about him. And uh, one thing we know is that he complained a lot about not being paid by his employer. Um, and he also complained about not having enough time to write his music. And he also complained about having librettists give him um, characters to work with that he couldn't, he couldn't work with. So it, there's, there's one famous letter, uh, which is really fun, which sa says, so you've sent me a libretto, this is all about winds, and I'm supposed to write music for these wind gods and goddesses. Um, Ariano was a success because it was a real woman, Orfeo was a success because it was a real man. How are winds supposed to talk? I have no idea. So get me a better libretto. So, <laughs> so we have that kind of information. We, and uh, there are other things, tragedies happened to him in his life. Um, one of them uh, was actually uh, related to um, um, a, a singer that was being trained to, to sing the role of Ariana under his care who died just shortly before the production and uh, her place had to be assumed by an actress, which is also a very fascinating thing that it wasn't, it wasn't another singer, uh, it, was, it was an actress who supplied the role of Ariana. Anyway, uh, so we have some of those details, but not, not that kind of broad stroke um, uh, biography of his emotional life. <laughs> I'd also, I, I, we were just talking about this with, um, my my seminar here at Juilliard where it's just the political history of early 17th century Italy meant that people, there was a lot of war. I mean, actually it's something that was extremely close to them. It's, it's we sort of think of it as this, oh, this affect of, of warlikeness. But in fact, it was a very, very, very personal issue that they had all been directly affected by. So we presented all three surviving Monteverdi operas in June of 2015, our Monteverdi trilogy, Ulissi, Popea, and Orfeo. Why do you guys keep returning to Monteverdi over and over and over again? I know you're cooking up some wonderful treats for, for the fall and, um, and even looking ahead. Well, for, for one thing, he's one of those figures, not only all of the fantastic things that uh, Paul described about his music and the variety of it and so on, but like I was saying, I, I feel that uh, we've, we've become acquainted with Monteverdi over the entirety of his career. Uh, so we, we see him uh, as a young man making this fabulous first uh, uh, operatic masterpiece without, without doubt, Orfeo. Uh, and we see him at the end of his life writing the, the most up-to-date um, operas that were uh, going then, uh, Ulisse and Popea. Uh, so we have this feeling that we know him over the, you know, the large arc of his career. And yet there are always things to discover. And that's why diving into um, book seven, like we are here, it's such an interesting moment for us to just sort of say, you know, what's going on at this particular moment. And it's it's revelatory over and over again. It doesn't matter which, which part of his life or career or music you jump into, there are always revelations for us. And I think there are always new things to be discovered because research keeps discovering new things about the performance of this music. And there were a couple of harmonies, which I think 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have 
used in the continuo, which have now recently been proven to have been absolutely part of the harmonic language of, of the time. So the music is so rich, there's always more to be discovered, and we're discovering more about the performance practices. So it always keeps it new and fresh. And with Monteverdi, I think you always want to feel like while you're returning to an old friend, you're discovering the riches of the music for the very first time. It's true. And since we've been doing this together for so long, it's, it's, like, it's like living in a country. You, you become increasingly fluent with the customs and with the patterns and with the habits. Um, I think we all just feel it's, it's and it's by, as Paul says, it's by no means that we've, we've found the, the key for it and we just apply that key wherever. It's a continuing process of rediscovering just how rich this language is and trying to speak it as, as fluently and as persuasively as we can. I'd like to add one, one thought about the Continuo team that we have. Um, as Robert says, it's a, it's a very special thing. It's not just that we have all the right instruments and all the right colors. It's the fact that we've been working together for so long that we don't need to write in our parts, this is the bit for the harpsichord and this is the bit for the harp, although we do some of that. Um, but everybody realizes what part of this larger organism, the sort of lyre of Monteverdi, we play. And so you can sort of come forward in those moments that your instrument has more to say about and sort of uh, recoil into, into the background when, uh, when it's less the case. And therefore, the whole thing feels very organic and spontaneous. And I must say, it's just a, a great pleasure to work with a team that knows each other so well. Well, we're the lucky beneficiaries of this beautiful rapport that you've all established together over these years. And needless to say, we're looking so forward to tonight's program. Um, after the Monteverdi concert, I want to remind all of you that you need to stick around for our late night 10 p.m. performance, another breathtakingly beautiful concert by our very own internationally acclaimed lutenist Paul Odette. Paul's program appropriately named Oh Joy, Elizabethan Lute Music of Solace and Joy includes works by Thomas Morley, John Dowland, William Byrd, Thomas Robinson, and others. Paul, Steve, and Robert, thank you so much for this illuminating talk. I know we could go on and on, but we've got, we've got other goodies uh, to offer. Thanks to the audience for joining us, and I can assure all of you that you are in for a wonderful treat. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.